Hello and welcome to episode 34 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and presumably so are you. Well, actually, pr probably not. I think there are a lot of non-gardeners listening now. It takes them away from those stressful lives disconnected from the soil. Anyway, this episode, it's very important to remember when I start talking later on about Salix Babylonica. I talk about it a little bit. Anyway, you've got to remember that Salix Babylonica comes from China. That's a key part of the anecdote that I left out. Have no fear, though. The rest of the podcast is all present, correct, and perfectly formed. I'm talking about a dazed and wafty week of swooning gardening. I'm talking about ailing ceanothus and woody wallflowers. And I'm talking about echinaceas of various kinds. I'm talking about Thumbergias. We haven't talked about Thumbergias on here yet. That'll be fun. I'm talking about ranunculus, lawn cutting, wheelbarrowing things around, drinking tea, drinking water, keeping hydrated in the heat. I'm talking about all sorts of sensible things that a gardener listening in mid-July 2018 might want to hear about. If that is you, then let's get on and listen to The Week in Gardening. Welcome to The Week in Gardening. This was a strange week in the garden. Well, I thought it was strange. The atmosphere felt somehow strange. We have reached that midsummer stillness when everything takes on a surreal air. It's, it's the air of Midsummer Night's Dream, I suppose. And it feels like if the garden is a boat sailing towards beauty, then it has become becalmed. We are stuck in a mat of seaweed without a cloud to break the horizon or a, a breeze to ruffle the sails. Everything is calm and I get the feeling that, that I could bump into the ghost of myself from a week ago doing the same jobs under the same remorseless sun. Perhaps I have just drunk too much salt water and I am going mad. Certainly it doesn't lend itself to, to getting stuck into very vigorous tasks. I felt this keenly on Monday when I spent a long time deep in thought, staring pensively at a dying Ceanothus. It's a very big Ceanothus and I had to think big thoughts around it. It's going to have to come out at some point this year because they're short-lived shrubs, the Ceanothus, and they live 12 or 15 years. And this one is definitely approaching senility. It's looking anemic and yellow and it hardly flowered at all this year. So it's going to come out. And the question is whether to take it out now, which I'd love to do, because the thing poisons the whole border. That shade of yellow somehow brings down the plants around it. And it brings down particularly because this, this border has lots of things like Acanthus mollis and one of the purple ajugas, that, that dark green and purple colour that really goes badly with a sickly yellow. It's, it's actually quite painful for me to look at sometimes. And I know it needs to come out, but... We have a big event coming up in the garden. The garden is getting one of its airings. There'll be lots of people around. We want it to make it look at its best. And taking the Ceanothus out will create a huge mess and a huge hole. And what I'm trying to do is, is work out how I can unsee the Ceanothus with, with a gardener's eye and see it again as a normal person, someone who has not slipped down the horticultural rabbit hole and reconcile myself to leaving it until the autumn when it can be dealt with more sympathetically and we can work out a suitable replacement plant. After all of this thinking, I decided that I could try and ignore it. I'm going to soften it slightly by planting some high grasses in front of it. 
and some high grasses with with silvery tones I think I look for some of those good silvery miscanthus that kind of thing because that will work sort of to, to bridge the the dark green purples and the sickly yellow green and calm everything down a little bit in there that'll work for for the party and then we can do something different for the next season so watch this space i'm sure in episode 35 you'll hear about planting grasses the rest of monday was spent in gentle watering of myself and the plants and i went home sticky and sweaty and surreal on the end of that day i should i should mention actually one of the other things that gave it a surreal edge were all of the butterflies I don't know if cabbage white butterflies have mass hatchings like flying ants or mayflies but there seemed to be some sort of butterfly event over the weekend and we were completely inundated with them hundreds and hundreds of them flocking over everything particularly everything purple loving the lavenders and the verbenas and the whole thing looked slightly like it had been generated by a computer program told animate the perfect English garden and the computer put loads of flowers in and then dotted these fluttering little butterflies over the top to try and convince us all that we were living in the real world and that 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 didn't help things very much so I went home to you to get some good sleep and hopefully come in in a more tethered state the next morning I reached the garden ready to actually do some work and I started by revamping a tired old border down near the compost complex and this border had a load of woody wallflowers woody perennial wallflowers the erysimum and they were looking distinctly awful they had no flowers on them they were just masses of stems and the, the leaves they had were no longer serving the purpose of blocking the light from the soil and stopping other things growing so there's all sorts of weeds growing underneath them it was time for them to go so I ripped them all out and actually they were hard and woody enough that I put them through the chipper the wood chipper which was quite fun and you realize I, I've i known on an intellectual level that wallflowers are members of the brassica family they're brassicaceae that is the family of the cabbage and the mustard and all of that kind of stuff but Apart from seeing their, their little cruciform flowers and saying, oh yes, that does look like a that does look like a mustard flower, I never really thought about it until I put them through a wood chipper and they smell so strongly of a mixture of cabbage soup and mustard that it was remarkable. The border looked a lot better without them. It's one of those situations where editing a plant out actually improves things the bare soil looked better than these out of control scraggly mops but i didn't want to leave it like that so i put some new plants in i put in some echinacea there's lots of echinacea in that border already the the classic tall echinacea which is just coming out now you know when it's going to it's going to be pink flowered but the petals are pretending that they're going to be yellow flowered and they'll fade and fade into pink and then they'll slowly droop down as the flower pushes up the seeds into that classical echinacea cone shape and these these are tall plants the flowers are flowering at about five foot tall so I put in a lower level of a dwarf hybrid echinacea and an orange one it's called skipper orange and it looks quite good it looks quite dense it's got lots and lots of flower buds on each plant and I don't know if this is the the psychedelic hangover from yesterday but it felt quite a, a 60s color combination to do the pink and the orange and the flower shape itself it's a very obvious flower shape it looks like something that you could get on a little 60s mini dress in orange and pink actually the whole the whole cone flower has a 60s trippy vibe to it i can imagine being asked do you want to go and, and smoke a cone that would um that would do no good at all for the productivity in the garden particularly in this heat and because we'd gone so hot in the pink and the orange combinations i also put in a load of alcamilla mollis that i had hanging around to cool things down and provide that that classic green around the base 
And what I do when I record these podcasts, I take a note after I've done something, and then I just read it and elaborate to talk to you. And every time I mention Alchemilla Mollus, it is saved by my phone on autocorrect as Alchemical Millie, which sounds great. I'd like to meet Alchemical Millie. She sounds like she could be in Tank Girl or something of that ilk. Anyway, uh, a border revamped to the point of newness by a few echinaceas, a bit of mustardy wood chipping, and our chemical millie. On Wednesday, I did some more watering, of course. I solved a little problem. I'd noticed that we put in an expanse of, of yew hedge quite recently, and I'd noticed that the last third of it was looking distinctly wilted, despite having put in an irrigation system, a drip hose, one of those hose pipes that leaks water like a sweating gardener. And obviously something was wrong, so I investigated and found that under the mulch, the hose pipe had become kinked. I think I found it in time. Those ones got some manual drenching, and I put the, the line back on to water in an efficient manner. I did some tying in, so I've talked quite frequently about my monstrous, mild, steel-framed, hanging basket and sweet pea bed. The sweet peas are going very well. They're still flowering abundantly. The flowering stalks, I feel, are slightly shorter than when the sweet peas were first flowering, which is a sign that the plant is losing energy and has decided, much like any sensible person in this weather, to give up. So hopefully I can keep them going until the party by, by keeping them deadheaded and tied in. But I have their successor slowly working its way up, coiling around plants ready to strike. And that is a yellow Thumbergia. Thumbergia is the, the black-eyed Susan, that plant that comes in shades of orange, red and yellow and twines its way very happily and excitedly up fences and over hillsides in hotter climes. I should have put it in earlier. It's still a little bit small and I should have definitely tied it to the frame because at the moment it is running around tripping up dahlias and getting itself tangled and twined around stems that are only going to be deadheaded off. So hopefully when the delicate business of removing the sweet peas once they've all started to go white and die, they, they, they will have a, a natural replacement in place to take over. This Thumbergia is it's an, an unnamed cultivar, which is annoying, because I got it from a, a commercial garden centre, and it just said Thumbergia yellow. But it's a nice clear yellow, and the, the black eye in the middle of it, from where it gets its name, Black Eyed Susan, uh, shows up magnificently. Keen followers of the monstrous hanging basket, sweet pea bed, will be pleased to know that the sweet peas have now grown up through the fountains and curtains of petunias and lobelias that are growing down and are now flowering above even the fuchsias in the hanging baskets, creating quite a surreal atmosphere. I think that it will upset a lot of people who are used to their sweet peas being in one place and their petunias being in another and on Wednesday, I, I sort of repeated the experience of the, the mustard scent from the wood chipper, but with a different plant. I took out an old Thuya. I think it was probably Thuya occidentalis, but it's quite hard to tell because the whole thing was completely dead and crispy. It had been planted underneath and in between a, a line of very, very deep existing thuyas as a, as a gap filler. And there it had stayed without light or water for goodness knows how many years. It had obviously been bought as a cone, like these young thuyas often are before they grow into 200 foot monsters. Grew up bought as quite a neat looking cone and it had stayed in that position as it slowly died. And that's quite, that's quite an achievement to kill a thuya. I was... When I worked in this garden up in North London, on the edge of Hampstead Heath, there was this Thuya hedge, and it was tall, it was very tall. The trees must have been 30 or 40 foot tall. And when it had been planted, the tree ties to attach them to the stakes, the stakes that had long rotted away, had been left on every single tree tie at a height of about four foot. And so these vast trees had this pinched-in little waist, like the waist of some disproportionate superhero from, from a comic book. 
and the, the trees dipped into this waste and then expanded out again on the other side. And they were growing away quite happily. I think one day there will be a breeze in the right direction and all of them will, will sever at four foot up and fall over as a perfect line. Anyway, this Thuya had done the impossible and died, and so that also was fed into the wood chipper. And as this is the smell cast this week, I can report that it had a very strong, almost menthol smell, like most of those cypress-type trees do. It smelled like Vicks Vapo Rub. So the chippings of that Thuya joined the chippings of the wallflower in the ever-hungry compost heap which this week I have been watering. I think it got a little bit dry, the texture resembling more apple crumble mix than a good dry cake mix. So I gave that a little bit of a, of a soaking and that should speed up the decomposition again. And that was it. That was Wednesday done. A shiny foreheaded, sun creamy kind of Wednesday, but a Wednesday nonetheless. On Thursday... I did some weeding. So I was weeding. I was weeding in the, the hoeing sense. I was going around with a sharp hoe and chopping weeds off and leaving them to shrivel. Shrivel is a good word, isn't it? And leaving them to shrivel under the hot sun. And normally this is advised for annual weeds because they are not going to re-sprout from the severed stem. But in this weather, even for perennial weeds, you don't want to be going around messing up your wrists and giving yourself blisters by trying to get a trowel into the ground. You don't want to hurt your undersole by stamping on a fork. So just chop the, the perennial weed off. And although you won't have finished it in one go, you'll have weakened it significantly. And all of this sunlight that would otherwise have been going into that root and fatting it up will be wasted. The plant will be slightly sicker. Next time it comes back, it will do it in a more pathetic manner. Hoeing is also a good towards the end of the week kind of job because it disturbs the surface of the soil. And there is something about disturbed soil that is more pleasing to the human eye for some reason than flat baked soil. If it is a, a flat plain with cracks in it, it looks somehow upsetting. But a gently crumbled, hoed topping looks like old Ben, the faithful gardener, has been making his diligent rounds. I also planted out all of those ranunculus that I talked about in, in goodness knows which episode. I talked about about a month and a half ago. The, the flowers that I had been inspired to plant by a dinner guest who brought a lovely bouquet of them. And I got them in far too late, but they've all come up. I lie. About 60% of them have come up. And they're looking like they're going to start forming buds fairly soon. So we're going to have the most out-of-season ranunculus in the world in this garden. Maybe I should sell the cut flowers to ranunculus addicts desperate for their fix. And that, that prompted me to get thinking about next year. We really need a dedicated cut flower garden where I can put things like this that have slightly weedy foliage but magnificent flowers out in little rows rather than scattering them through herbaceous plantings where they look slightly like underdressed guests at a wedding. And then it was Friday. I did a little bit of tending to the dahlias more deadheading. So I was taking off those dahlias that have lost their charming button-like, button mushroom-like form before they, they flower and had done their flowering and then had turned into that squidgy pointed form that shows right time for the chop. I was also freeing some of the dahlias. The green dahlias, particularly Downham Royal, has been massively attacked by aphid, by black fly. Uh, some of them, the, the stems look like a whole new variety, the black stem dahlia, but it's actually a mass of insects crawling over the plant like one of those, those mating crab rituals you see on nature documentaries where the crabs are 14 or 15 crabs deep in their orgiastic joy. These, uh, these black fly weren't, weren't quite at that level, but they were getting close. So I used a non-chemical control called my fingers. But we, we won't dwell on that matter for too long. And after that, it was just giving the garden its general Friday tidy up. A bit of a haircut, 
pulled out all of the nostril hairs, the edges got trimmed, the soil got slightly titivated in parts. There was great drama when the ride-on lawnmower started leaking some oily fluid over the very fine croquet lawn. And we don't even cut that with the, the ride-on mower. We cut it with a, a wonderful Dennis cylinder mower. So that was particularly aggravating. It was, um, I think it was hydraulic fluid, not engine oil, because it was, it was a lot clearer. And I don't know if that's any less detrimental to the grass than engine oil. It felt, it felt that way to me. And we, we cleaned that off, washed it through with lots and lots of water. I'll keep you updated. No doubt it will slowly die off in time for the grand party. In which case I plan to attend the party and I will just lie on that patch of lawn for the afternoon. And that was it, the end of another week in gardening. It's amazing how they drift on past. I got a very nice email this week from a chap called Robert who told me all about his week in gardening and gave me a few suggestions for, for things that he'd picked up between the lines on the podcast. And I hope that I was, in return, able to give him a few tips for the questions that he had raised. So if anyone wants to tell me about their week, then I'd love to hear from you. It is thegardenlogpodcast at gmail.com. Now, let's see if I have any horticultural recommendations this week. There is a new horticultural podcast on the block, one for you to listen to in the rest of the week when you're not listening to this one. It's called Roots and All, that's roots as in the part of the plant under the ground and as in the popular conjunction and all as in everything. It's by a horticulturalist and garden designer called Sarah Wilson. And from what I've heard, she knows her stuff and she's got a great range of guests talking about all sorts of interesting things for the beginner and expert alike. I listened to a few of those episodes this week and I enjoyed them very much. I also listened to the latest episode of Natural Histories on Radio 4. And for those of you unfamiliar with the output of BBC Radio 4, I doubt there's very many of you. I think we probably have quite a strong crossover audience. Anyway, Natural Histories is a program that takes a species, or in this case a genus, and that could be animal or plant, and looks at it in depth in a cultural context normally. So its appearances in poetry, in the visual arts, and its role in shaping human society generally. There are personal anecdotes and reflections, and there are macro views of how this species might have shaped the world. This week was a plant episode, which is sometimes a worry for me, because the plant episodes aren't as good as the animal ones, because plants don't tend to evoke such obsessive interest in people as otters or shrews or earthworms do. But this episode was the willow, and the willow has such a strong role in society and culture, and it has weird, whiffy wothy swaying, mystical, wafting kind of beliefs around it. So that's quite good. It was a um, much better episode than the one about grass from a couple of years ago, because grass is too big a subject, and all you got were people saying, well, everything is made of grass. Think about it. You eat a cow, it's made of grass. You eat a sheep, it's made of grass. And then it had a load of people saying like, I don't know about you, but I love the smell of grass cut on a summer's day. And you want to say, well, yes, who doesn't? Who doesn't? We all love it. We are a herd. We are cows after all. The, the favourite fact I picked up from that episode was that the, the weeping willow, which I always known as Salix Babylonica, is not named for the geographic region. I always assumed that it was a willow that originated somewhere around Syria or Iraq, somewhere in Mesopotamia, which would give it that kind of name. But it actually comes from the biblical verse, from Psalm 137, 
by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept, when we remembered Zion. The second, less, regified line of which is, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. And that's where we get Salix Babylonica from. Anyway, that's well worth a listen. It is on the BBC iPlayer radio app. When I first announced my momentous shift into the world of gardening, away from the path that I had prior to that been treading, my friend rushed out and brought me a slightly ironic gift, which was a copy of a book called The Tree Ogham. And the, the Tree Ogham, well, it says that this book will guide you through the process of making your own ogham sticks, one for each tree, understanding the underlying energy and spiritual guidance each tree has to show us, and ways of communicating with trees as an aid to spiritual development and healing. It's basically a, a book for conducting tree magic. And this book tells me that the willow is a very receptive tree, and it's very used to contact with humankind because of the ancient tradition of basket weaving. So we've been handling willow and fiddling around with it for such a long time that it is inclined to be our friend. I've been reading a very good book this week in an attempt to get my brain re-engaged and working again after years of fiddling around in the soil get my brain working before this masters that I'm starting in September. So I have been reading a book called The London Town Garden, 1700 to 1840. And that's by Todd Langstaff Gowan, the celebrated garden historian and designer. It's a very good book if you want to know more about Georgian gardening in general, and the, the lesser known subject of what they were up to in the towns and cities. All those landscaped parks can, can be ignored for the time being. Some of the things that I was struck by were how little things change in the world of gardening. He quotes John Claudius Loudon, who was writing in 1838 about the practices of nefarious London builders, building new-build gardens shoddily and shonkily, and conning people into thinking that they had a horticultural oasis. And this sounds like the kind of complaining conversation you can hear from gardeners and homeowners across the country nowadays. He ends it by saying, If the soil were a strong clay, the whole garden would be so damp during the greater part of the year as not only to preclude all enjoyments, either from walking round it or cultivating plants in it, but from the surface being at all times saturated with moisture, the dug ground soddened and the gravel of the walks blackened and covered with lichens, a kind of malaria would be produced, which might bring on fever and other diseases, all this the builder might have prevented by proper under-drainage, but this would have added considerably to his expense, and not told in the eyes of his customers. So there you go, shoddy new build gardens are a fine British tradition, part of our horticultural heritage. So you can take that as a recommendation, not only for this magnificent book, The London Town Garden, but also for John Claudius Loudon, who I think would certainly have a horticultural podcast had he been alive today. He wrote books such as Hints on the Formation of Gardens and Pleasure Grounds, and The Suburban Gardener, The Greenhouse Companion, and also The Encyclopedia of Gardening. And I think his wife might have been a gardener as well because looking at the bibliography here, I can see a book by a Jane Loudon called Gardening for Ladies. I'm sorry, ladies listening to this podcast, who have not picked up any specific tips. I promise I will do a special Gardening for Ladies episode one day soon. Thank you for listening to episode 34 of The Garden Log. I certainly enjoyed recording it, so I hope that it fell on your ears in a pleasing manner, that it fell on your ears like the reassuring drops of rain from a cloudy sky that we all hope for one day soon. If you would like to email me, you can do so on thegardenlogpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter 
at Ben's Garden or on Instagram at Gardener Dark. You could also, if you were so inclined, go on to the review page or whatever application you use to listen to podcasts and leave me a review. I do have some reviews, quite a few reviews now on iTunes, and they are wonderful. The most popular one is a five-star review which says, an excellent cure for insomnia. So, well, hopefully you've come to the end of the half an hour, so you're now drifting off to sleep, whoever wrote that. So goodbye, good gardening, and good night. Thank you.